Good evening, everybody. If you will, open your Bibles up to 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21. Good to be back with you. Uh, I, I, I missed some of that, so I won't do much of a review, but this is kind of a, a, a place where we have a fresh start as far as material goes. We don't have to necessarily have a running go to get into tonight's material because what we have starting in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 15, is we, we kind of almost have a summary of some things that went on in David's life. So we're not necessarily chronologically following the narrative anymore. Now we're dealing with a summary of some things that happened in David's life. And we don't know exactly where all of these events plugged in, but they have a common theme through it. And we'll kind of try to touch on that common theme as, as we go through this uh, tonight. So in chapter 21, verses 15 through 22, we have four giants that were killed by David's mighty men. Now, the most famous giant of all is who? Goliath. And who killed him? David did. Uh, but there were other giants that the Philistines had of the same family of the, uh, in, in the city of Gath that came from Gath, and David's men destroyed them as well. And we don't have a, a lot of detail about all of that. We just have some detail about that. But we see God being able to do amazing things. Do you remember what the children of Israel were afraid of when the spies came back to Kadesh Barnea and said that the land was a good land, but they're full of giants. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. No way we can stand up against them. And what we see in David's life is, yes, when God is with you, you can and you can defeat them. And so we see that happen. Any thoughts? you have any thoughts before we get started? You know, we just get a flavor into these mighty men of David. And these are, you know, these are some pretty astounding stories. And of course, you know, you know, when you, if you, if you casually read this, uh, you know, especially in today's time, you may get a glimpse into thinking on a line of like Marvel characters. But let's remember that at the heart of this, the power is coming from who? God. Yeah, these aren't just men of renown of their own. You know, God is working with these men and accomplishing great feats through these men. So we normally think of Jonathan and the great things that Jonathan did. You remember when uh, when he and his armor bearer scaled up the the uh, cliffside there and attacked the Philistine garrison and they fell before him and basically he routed the whole Philistine army with that with that, that battle. And then we think of David slaying Goliath and we think, oh wow, that the Lord's with them and look what the Lord's able to do. But, and like you said, that that was not the only occasions things like that were happening. They were happening with, with David's other men too, so we have just a glimpse of that here. So moving into this material, verse 15. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. This is not what we would expect of David. David has been the man of action, the man that, that uh, could endure. I don't know at what point in David's life this is. You don't have to be an older man to grow faint, but uh, maybe he is getting older at this point. We know this will be one of his last battles that he goes out in and fights in. His men see to that. And so maybe he was, uh, his age was showing just a little bit. I, I did a sermon years ago, and I, I made me dust that one off again, because I remember being really impressed with the idea, following the life of David and seeing him as a youth, and then seeing him later, and then seeing him grow faint, and then seeing him in his old age where he can't keep warm, and then he goes the way of all the earth. And you look at that and you say, well, how can such a strong man... It, well, that's what happens. That's what happens to all of us. And maybe this is a hint of, of, of we see David now in his physical decline. Not, not the warrior that he once was. He grows faint. And Ishbi Benob, one of the sons of the giants, saw him, by the way, the weight of his bronze spear was 300 shekels. Anybody have a conversion on that? Eight pounds! How many of you have slung a sledgehammer very much? What size do sledgehammers normally come in? Two, five, ten. Yeah, a ten, a ten pound sledgehammer is a handful. It'll wear me out. <laughs> <laughs> it's the swinging price that'll get you. This was a spearhead 
that was about eight pounds, and he had a, he was bearing a new sword, and he thought he could kill David. He sees David is is uh, is fatigued and tired, and he thought he could kill David, and it appears that maybe he would, except Abishai, the son of Zerah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the the men of David swore to him, saying, "You shall go out no more with battle, uh, with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel." And so uh, they realized at this point, David, you don't, we can't afford to lose you. You don't need to be out here in the battle fighting. Uh, let us do that. And so it seems like this is one of the last times that David goes out and leads his army in that way. But uh, Abishai, or Abishai, we, we know who he is. We've seen him before. Yes, yes. Uh, he's one of David's relatives, and he's been instrumental in leading David's, at least a third of David's army, and uh, and here he comes to David's rescue on this occasion. you have any thoughts on that? No. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to hear more feats. Uh, Abishai, however you want to say his name, we're going to read a little bit more about him later on uh, amongst David's elite yep. men. Verse 18, after this, there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. Then, uh, you got a, you got a pronunciation on this one? Sub, Sabikiai. Sabikiai or? Hey, I like that. That's good. I don't, the, the, you said it with the Hebrew accent. That was very okay. good. <laughs> Struck down Saf, who was one of the descendants of the giants. And there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. And then Elhanan, the son of Jeroragim. The Bethlehemite struck down Goliath the Gittite, uh, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Now, looking at First Chronicles account, it, it suggests that this uh, Gittite was uh, the the son, I think, or a descendant of Goliath, and it gave a different name. I forget the name that was given. If you're reading from the New King James, what does it say here? The brother. The brother, and, uh, and and it's in italics. You notice it's in italics here. But if you go over to the First Chronicles account, it says the brother of it. It's not in italics, and so that was in the text. And uh, so this is uh, I, this is one of the passages that uh, people who have very shallow criticisms of the Bible go to and say, "See, the Bible even contradicts who killed Goliath." In, in, in First Samuel, it says that it's it's David who killed Goliath. Here, it says that it was one of David's men who killed Goliath. And uh, but it, the reason that the the uh, editors of the New King James supply the brother of here is because it's obvious. It's implied. Uh, from the rest of the, the text and, the, and also in First Chronicles that it was the brother of Goliath and not, not Goliath. And so I think, I think that's a pretty simple one to, to recognize, although some have, have made issue that. Yes? David was a younger man who killed Goliath. Right. He's an old man now. He's older. He probably couldn't even hold up for that now. So. Yeah. Yeah, the context does not support that this is another another event of, of Goliath being killed. What about the uh, the illustration of the weavers being? I know we've talked about that in right. the past, but uh, I wasn't able to find anything. I couldn't remember anything as far as point of reference on that. Yeah, so uh, spears normally didn't have eight-pound spearheads on it, and normally they were a relatively uh, thin shaft, uh, something that could be easily handled by by average sized people and something that could be thrown and so forth. So a weaver's beam, and, and again, I don't have all of the dimensions of a loom and all of that, but a weaver's beam was much larger. It was, it, it, it was you know, quite a bit around. My little hand probably wouldn't, wouldn't fit around it very well. And so it takes a pretty good sized guy to have a spear that's the size of a weaver's beam. And uh, I, I think, didn't it describe Goliath's spear that way in First Samuel? I think so. I think you have the same description here, and that's some other thing that makes people think, no, this is Goliath, because it describes his, his uh, spear the same way. Um, but I, I, don't, I, don't think that, I don't think it's Goliath, but it does describe the spear the same way. And so, large spear, just giving the idea that uh, this, is a, this, this is a giant-sized spear. Yeah, it's just trying to give us some scale to uh, the, yeah, uh, that's right. the size of this, uh, this enemy. One says, uh, post. Size of a post. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. <laughs> it is. 
All right, we'll finish the chapter out. And there was again war at Gath. And there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. And he also was descended from the giants. And when he taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, or Shimei, 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 David's brother, struck him down. These four were descended from the giants in Gath. And they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So just as you said, these four were were great warriors. Uh, and these were champions, I'm sure. All, all of them were champions of the Philistines. And yet David's men, uh, David and his men, were able to handle these. But of course, we know who was at the heart of these victories. Have you ever... Uh, so it, it seems that maybe these were all brothers all brothers of Goliath. So, how many would that make total, sons of the giant? Five. How many stones did David pick up in the brook? Yeah, so some have wondered, well, why is, that, why is it significant that he picked up five stones? Did he think he may need all five and he only ended up needing one? Maybe that's the case. I don't want to stretch this too far. But someone has noted, now wait a minute, he picked up five stones and really we have five sons of the giant from Gath that are defeated by David and his men. David didn't get all five of them there on that battle, but he and his men eventually got all of them. And uh, so I don't, know, I don't know what to make of that. I don't want to stretch that too far, but if nothing else, that'll help. That'll be a, a memory device for you to remember how many, how many giants David and his men slew by how many stones he picked up in the brook, in the Valley of Elah. Any other thoughts through chapter 21? All right, let's skip chapter 22 for right now. And uh, let's go over to chapter 23, and I want to drop all the way down to verse 8. We're going to come back to that in just a second, but let's group this together. Since we're talking about the feats of David's men, how they killed four of the giants there, uh, in chapter 23, verse 8, we talk a little bit about David's mighty men and some of the feats that they conquered and who they were, and some of the things that they did. And as you said, it's almost like these are superheroes mm -hmm. and, and what they accomplish here. And uh, David had a, a lot of very valiant men, and uh, these rose to the top, and I think we can see why they rose to the top. So looking in chapter 23, in verse 8, it says, These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. And the first one is Josheb Basabeth. The 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 I'm glad you got this. Yes, that was that was great. <laughs> Chief among the captains. So this was this was the top of his mighty men right here. Uh, he was called Adino or Adano, uh, the Enazite, because he had killed how many men? Eight hundred at one time. Now, I, I you know maybe maybe that could be a language saying that he led a garrison of men that happened to defeat 800 Philistines or 800 Ammonites or whatever at one time. But as this is talking about, I don't think that's what it's saying. I think he killed 800 men at one time. And uh, you know I've mentioned this before, but in 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 Hollywood, you know you watch Lord of the Rings or whatever, and uh, they run into battle, and you've got one guy, and he's just, you know, and he touches them with the sword, and they fall over dead, and they never move again. That's not how hand-to-hand -hand combat really is. Uh, it, when you're struggling for your life, and somebody cuts you on your arm with a sword, you don't stop fighting. You don't fall over and stop fighting. You keep fighting. And so, you know, many times it's just wrestling, and almost a wrestling match is what it, what it turns into many times. But I get the picture that this guy's really running through an army, and they're just mowing them down as he goes. And uh, I don't know how else you can kill 800 at one time, and, unless that's the case. So, so those pictures that you see of the hero in, in, in sword fighting Hollywood movie, that's not real life, but that probably does give us some picture of what this guy looked like <laughs> in, in battle. And so the Lord was with him, helped him mightily, and you see what he could do there. All right. Verse 9. And next to him, among the three mighty men, was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ahoi. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle. 
and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. So here's a character where in the, the heat of battle, what does everybody do? Everybody but but David and Eleazar. Everybody withdraws. Yeah, they retreat from, from the, the scene. And yet this man stays with it. You know, you, you see a sense of fierceness uh, with Eleazar. And he battled so hard that his hand just clung to the sword. He couldn't even seem to even be able to open his hand afterwards. It was just fixed, right? you know, for a period of time on that sword. And it says everybody else showed up what? Yeah. <laughs> they, they came in after all the work was done. And uh, so this is, the, you know, and they, we're getting descriptions of, of three individuals here. And these are three special individuals amongst David's, you know, his, his whole military, his whole army. Because these three stand above. I mean, they, they carry out feats that far exceed everybody else's. You know, David has a lot of mighty men here, and the description of them is pretty great, but these three right here stand alone. That's what you're seeing with these characters. They stand completely alone, and, you know, we're going to have a story here in a minute that kind of describes that. I can just imagine uh, some of David's men telling this story later to their kids or, or whoever, say, you know, the Philistines were coming... And we were greatly outnumbered, so we thought we would all flee, and we turned around and ran. But Eliezer, he didn't run. And, uh, and, and so we ran, and we turned around and looked, and there were no Philistines coming. He, had, he was knocking them all down over there. So finally, we go back to him. By the time we got there, they were all dead. And we got to him, and he couldn't open his hand. We had to pry his fingers open to get the sword out of his hand. You know, can you just imagine them telling that story? of what they saw there. And I know I've mentioned this several times, but I think about it because it, it's, it's what I can relate to on this. But I was clearing a fence line one time and I was using a machete and cutting the buyers and honeysuckle and everything out of that. And I did that long enough that when I, I went to let go of it, my fingers were actual. I couldn't, I couldn't open my fingers from the machete. And, uh, and I thought about this story, and, and I thought, yeah, that was just cutting briars. Imagine if it was Philistines that you <laughs> were after. And so, uh, so I, I can relate to that at least a little bit there. That's not unrealistic what happened there. So. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the next verse, then you can take okay. the story. All right. And next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, Lehi where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great victory. Again, you know, what these men were, were they were you know, commit, committing great feats and everything. But again, they were instruments of God. You know, God was using these, as that last verse implies there, that the Lord worked a great victory. Uh, by the hand of, of this individual. but And that's what all these men were. Now, that's not to take anything away from these men. These men were men of, of great faith, and these men were, were, I have no doubt, great warriors in and of themselves. But we're seeing superhuman feats taking place here. So let's, let's do kind of keep a perspective on what's being described here, not give, you know, man too much glory here. But what do these men have in common other than God has done amazing things to them? What do you see? They're devoted to David. They love David. They have formed an alliance for David. Okay. To honor yes. They're, they're loyal to David. We will definitely see that in that next story. What else do you see in these? I think all of them fear God and that they have been trained up since they've been a child to do what God commands and God's appointed leader is David and since David told them to do it they're actually following God's commandment that David had commanded them to do so they not only trust David's command but they trust it by what he's told them to do that God will be with them and 
Help them in the battle. All right. And with that, they stand. They stand. God's people need to be people that stand. They need to be people that will stand against an innumerable host that oppose them. They need to be people that will stand when all of their comrades flee. They need to be people that stand. And when you look in the first century, Christians stood. They didn't wield a physical sword. They didn't slay 800 of the pagans by brute force. They stood. And when they came and said, you will either worship Caesar or you will die, they said, we will die. We need to be people that stand. That's who God can use. And so when I look at these men, and I think, well, what is it? Why is it that God's able to do such amazing things with them? It's because they were willing to stand. And I think it was they, the reason they stood is because of what Steve was talking about. Their faith in God, their loyalty to the, God, the Lord's anointed. But they were willing to stand. And, uh, and, and I think that what's, what my biggest weakness, our biggest weakness, I think, is too often we're not willing to stand. We're not willing to, when everybody else retreats, when everybody else seems to be against us, we're not willing to stand for the truth and do that. And so I think that's, that's something that we can look at and say, all right, God still needs mighty men today, and we can be mighty men for God today, but we have to be willing to trust Him, and we have to be willing to stand. All right, so verse 13. Then three of the thirty chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam. Now we've talked about the cave of Adullam before. And a troop of Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was in the stronghold and the garrison of Philistines was in Bethlehem. What's Bethlehem to David? Hometown. Where he grew up. And the Philistines are there occupying that territory. Now why is David in the cave of Adullam? Yeah, he's hiding from Saul. And so he's got, he's got the enemy and his own people, and then Israel's enemy is occupying his hometown. Kind of a, a disturbing time for David. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. I think all that he's doing here, he's saying, Boy, I wish things were such that I could be at home and I could drink from that well that's there. The cave of Adullam in the wilderness of Judea, I don't have any slides of that, but it's a parched and barren land. <laughs> and a, a, the thought of a cool drink from a hometown well was probably pretty appealing. And he says that, and he says it out loud. He says longingly, oh, that someone would give me a drink from the water. I don't think he had any intention of somebody really doing that. Just daydreaming. Just daydreaming. Just thinking about it. So, the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well at Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is it not blood? Is not excuse me, is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. And these things were done by the three mighty men. And so, he says this, but look what the men do. Oh, our master, our Lord, he wants a drink. He wants a drink from the, the, the well at Bethlehem. Okay, well let's go get it. And they go through and they risk their lives to break through and get this and bring it just because they think this would please him. And David, he's like, no, no I never intended that. I never intended that. But that willingness, I think the reason this is in this, in this section is to show us what Sherry was saying earlier. The loyalty that these men have to David. They would do anything for them. They are just waiting to hear what his will may be to accomplish that. Uh, we pray, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have a few pictures of what the way God's will may be performed in heaven. We have pictures of Gabriel talking about that I stand before the Lord. What is he doing? He's like an attendant waiting. 
What are your orders, Lord? What do you want me to do? That's what the angels in heaven seem to be doing, waiting for the commands. What you see here is you see David's men having that same spirit about them. What is it that our Lord wants? That is what we want to do. That's the same spirit we should have towards the Lord. What is it that, that God wants us to do? We're looking for that. We're searching for that. And so somebody would say, well, you're just being nitpicky about, about all of those things. No, no, I want to be sure that I'm doing what my Lord's will is. I want to have that same attitude that I'm listening, I'm looking, I'm searching through the Scripture. I'm looking for instruction and commands. I'm looking for examples. I'm looking for anything that shows me what His will might be because I want to do that. I want to please Him. We, we know that. We know that feeling. Uh, at some time in our life, we probably courted somebody, we dated somebody, and boy, we were just looking to hear what, if they just casually mentioned, I like the color lavender. Guess what color birthday card we picked out? You know, we were looking to, what, what is it that would please them? And uh, you see that in David's men here, you see that in that loyalty, and that's the loyalty that we should have towards the Lord as well. And if we do have that type of loyalty, loyalty it exhibits itself in the same way. That, uh, that we have that courage to we'll put our lives at risk to please Him and honor Him. And somebody says, well, why are you doing that? Are you doing that because you're afraid you'll go to hell if you don't? Well, that's not a bad motivation. But I'm doing that because I want my Lord to be pleased. I want to please Him. Yes? Yes. That's right. That's exactly right. Exactly right. You know, I've, I've brought it up in the past. Uh, me obeying the gospel was probably primarily motivated by the fear of hell. Mm -hmm. But, and that's what I think a lot of people's motivation is at the beginning. But as you learn more and more about God, his traits and character and his mercy and loving kindness and, you know, the, the list is... It's forever long. Uh, you learn to uh, love Him. You learn to adore Him. Admire Him. And, you know, as the Scripture says, you know, you want to be like Him. And, and that's what we should be striving every day. And I think that's what this encapsulates. Is, you know, when you have a, a admiration for someone, you know, you want to you wanna become like them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, a, as children, you know, when... When we're young, a lot of times we have heroes. We have, you know, and we think, well, I'd really like to be like him. Well, you know, as adults, as we learn more about God, that's who we want to be like. That's what that's what it's supposed to be as far as maturing and uh, becoming more like him. Yep. Any other thoughts before we get into the next three mighty men? All right. Verse 18, now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zerah, was chief of the 30, and he wielded his spear against 300 men and killed them and won a name beside the three. He was the most renowned of the 30. Now, this is the first mention of 30. We've got a, we've got a list here that we'll get to at the end of the chapter. For clarification, how many of your texts say three? Okay, so the New King James says three rather than okay. 30 there. And uh, numbers are one of the most challenging things uh, to continually to be copied correctly and to be translated and so forth. And, and so we've already seen uh, one instance of that, I, I think. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, we haven't yet. But, but this is one. So the New King James, some, some texts give the indication that uh, Abishai or Abishai is the is one of the second group of mighty men, the three. We are going to be given thirty here in this listing, and so it, it could go either way. It could go either way, depending on which manuscript and, and the and the, the the reading there in that. Yeah, and I think that makes sense with how verse nineteen finishes, as far as him being listed with the three. But uh, he's not. He's not one of the first but three. He did not attain. Yeah. To the three. Right. So it's almost like, well, he's number four. Yes. <laughs> you right. know, he fits in that category. You've yes. got the three, and then you got you mm -hmm. got him. Yeah. And so I think that's the way that's uh, settling that. Verse 20, and Benaiah, mm -hmm. the son of Jehoiada, 
was a valiant man of Kabzeel, a doer of great deeds. He struck down two aerials of Moab. Now, I've got a footnote on that aerials, and it's unknown. I don't know if you have anything on that. I couldn't find anything. Yeah, so Ariel, uh, I believe, uh, means Lion King. Uh, no, it's not Lion King. Well, my, my Bible says Lion Like. Right, yes. Yeah, the New King James words, uh, Lion Like, uh, uh, let's see, Lion Like Heroes of Moab. Uh, Ariel, though, means, uh, man, it's, uh, anybody help me out here? Uh, it may be Lion, Lion of God. Okay, L, yeah, Ariel, Lion of God. And uh, so uh, that that's the word that is in the text. It, it seems to be describing these men as uh, lion-like masters or lion-like lords, heroes. And so I think that's the reason the, the New King James translates lion-like heroes of Moab. Okay. So it says, he also went down and struck down a lion in a pit, not uh, on a day when the snow had fallen. So is this making reference to the lion-like heroes of Moab, or is it talking about a literal lion? I think it's a literal lion. So I think that there was a battle in which he killed two lion-like heroes of Moab, and maybe, uh, maybe that description is used of them there because it also fits with his reputation for killing literal lions. As, as well, and so maybe that comparison is made there. I, it, at least, you know, there is obviously a similitude in this, but uh, it seems like he killed some heroes of Moab, and there was an occasion where uh, he killed a lion in a pit. And But a pretty bad dude. I mean, think, yes. about, think about, first of all, snow was not real common, and, and so that was a memorable thing. Remember the time where it snowed, and we, we found that lion in the pit, and uh, and, and do you remember Benea just jumping down in there and killing that lion? Man, that was crazy. What <laughs> you know? I mean, so so that that was the type of thing that happened, and everybody remembered him for that. But he was a mighty warrior as well. Verse twenty one, and he struck down an Egyptian, a handsome man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but Benaiah went down to him with a staff. So you think a, a spear versus a staff? You know that's not good. That's not good odds. But look how bad this dude is. He snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. So, uh, <laughs> again, another pretty bad dude. Uh, verse 22, These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, Jehoiada, and won a name beside the three mighty men. He was renowned among the thirty, but he did not attain to the three. And David set him over his bodyguard. And I think we... We saw that maybe at the end of uh, chapter 20. I think it has that list that mentions him. But uh, again, you know, this is one that is mentioned not, you know, I wouldn't say as an afterthought, but, you know, he was great. This is a mighty man of valor, but he still didn't attain to the three. Yeah. So how special are these three looking at this point in time? Uh, pretty incredible. Yeah. And what's weird, th those first three, we really don't have any information about them in other places. In other words, we're given this information. We're told about Benai in other places. We're told about Abishai in other places. Mm -hmm. But we're not told about these guys in other places. Yeah. And yet they were the top. Well, you, you have a, uh, verses 8 through 12 that gives us a small sampling of them. Yeah. That's... And then they, they fit in that marvelous story that you told mm -hmm. there of uh, the cave of, of Adullam. You know, right. That's kind of their highlight reel. Yep. But, you know, it gives us a little bit of flavor about them, but it gives us names as well. Right. Their names. Yep. This may be an example of the 300 men that was with David from the get -go. These may have been the men that wasn't talked about, but just said that they were men that were with David and guarded him. Yeah. And if you had these along with the other ones in that 300, and God was with them protecting them, I mean, what should you fear from anybody? Yeah, that's right. I think that's, that's a good point. So in this last section of this chapter, we have the 30 mentioned here. And 
there's a few of these names. I'm not going to go through and slaughter all these names in front of you. Uh, I, left <laughs> I will point out just a few in here that are mentioned elsewhere that we know something about that are significant. All of these individuals, uh, no doubt, I mean, you don't get to be part of this 30 without being men of renown. But we're not giving them any details about this except their names here. But we will we'll mention verse 24, Asahel, the brother of Joab. You remember Asahel? And uh, who killed him? Abner did. I wasn't here for that class, but you remember Asahel was like a gazelle on his feet and he was chasing down Abner. And Abner said, go, go find a younger man. Take his armor. And Asahel kept on. And finally, Abner stuck him with the blunt end of the spear and he died. And uh, so that was one of, of, David, of these 30. Uh, you, if you drop down to verse 34, we see uh, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel. The son of Ahithophel. This seems to be the same Ahithophel that was David's counselor that defected to, to uh, betrayed him to Absalom. And uh, Elam may be the father of Bathsheba. So we know that David has one link to his mighty men through Bathsheba. Who's that? Her husband. Uriah the Hittite, you notice verse 39? Uriah the Hittite was one of them. And, uh, and, and, but it may have been that her father was also one of David's mighty men, which may be how she met Uriah. Uh, we don't know. That, that's, the names match there, but we don't know if we can for sure nail that together. But that's that's interesting connection there. So we're, we're given all these men. In our last few minutes, we're not going to have time to go through everything. But Gerald and I were talking just briefly before, before uh, services here. That uh, these are the men who saved David. These are the men who conquered for David. These, these, if you were going to give earthly credit to why David's kingdom was successful, you would look at his army and say, this is the reason why. If you were to look and say, well, who saved David's life? Well, we would go back and we would say, that uh, um, uh, I'm gonna make sure I just went blank on the, uh, Abishai. Abishai, he saved David's life when he grew faint there, and the giant was about to kill him. But now go back, go back to chapter 22. In chapter 22, it says David spoke the word, the, uh, spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, the God of my strength. In Him I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. So who does David give credit to? God. Because that's right. That's who is saving him. How was God saving him? Through these men. Through these men. Now, how did these men come to be around David? Yes. Why do you think that they decided to go when David was on the run? They gathered around him. Why do you think that they were motivated to gather around him? Yeah. David didn't have anything to offer anybody. No, he didn't. You know, he was on the run. Steve's saying, God, I completely agree. David was a loyal person that they were around scared. I think that that's right. What drew Jonathan to David? He saw him stand when nobody else would stand. And it, now, da Jonathan had done that, but he didn't find many people like that that would do that. But he saw that David was like that, and he was drawn to David, and his heart was knit to David because of that. You know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if these men who are willing to stand are drawn to David because they see he has that type of faith. He's willing to stand. I want to be with people like that. I want to surround myself with people like that. And I think that that is how God uses people to help us and to save us, is that we behave like we're supposed to behave. We're faithful to the Lord. We're devoted to the Lord. We're courageous for the Lord. And those type of people tend to surround us. And through them, God does protect us. And it becomes a shield and a protector 
and you think about what is the church supposed to be? It's supposed to be a group of that kind of people. <laughs> that kind of people. What does the Lord do through the church for us individually? He should help us. He should, they should strengthen us. They should build us up. They should see us through difficult times. I think that's exactly what we see. And so I love these, I love these pictures where we see God at work, but the way that God works is through what we would consider natural means. He surrounds us with good people. Well, how do, how, do, how do we end up being surrounded by good people? It's because we're faithful to the Lord and devoted to the Lord, and therefore it draws others to be around us. And then that builds and builds, and through that, God can do amazing things. I'll point out this. I, I do want us to look at this psalm because it's a beautiful psalm. We'll have to save some of this for next time. But I just want to point out one thing. Drop down in, in a psalm. Uh, sorry, not Psalm 22. 2 Samuel. <laughs> yeah, it is a psalm. 2 Samuel 22. Drop down to verse um, 24. Look at what David says. I was also blameless before him. I kept myself from my, from my iniquity. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness, my cleanness in his eyes. What, was David blameless? So is David lying here? God forgave him. Nobody's perfect. But was adultery and murder characteristic of David? No, that was out of character. That was uncharacteristic of David. And then what did he do when he sinned? He repented. He repented. What, what David is saying here is the Lord has been with me because I tried to be loyal to Him. I tried to be devoted to Him. That was my character. That was my longing. That's what my real intention was, was to be loyal to Him. And so the Lord was with me. Well, drawing this together with the type of people that surrounded David, they see David as a righteous man, a good man, a man that's trying to do what's right. And they're willing to support that and encourage that. And so, yes, God is David's fortress. And God used men that were drawn to David's faith to protect him and shield him and help him and save him. And I think that God still works that way today. And uh, so I think we just have a beautiful picture here uh, of that. God gets the credit for it, obviously. But God does it many times through other people. And the way that those other people end up being around us is because we're striving to be what we should be. And when we're not striving to be what we should be, we don't tend to attract those type of people. And maybe we, we end up forsaking the very uh, help that God would like to give us in that. All right, any any. Final thoughts. You have, I, I, you know, verse twenty nine. Uh, For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens lightens my darkness. You know, boy, that sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Sounds like Psalms one nineteen one hundred five. Yep. yep, a psalm which apparently David didn't write. But when you think of David when he was on the run from Saul, do you think that it it appeared from his perspective darkness? Was things dark for him? Was was you know his situation dark? But where did he find light? In God. God, you know, guided him through that maze of the wilderness when he was out there, where it seemed like the whole world was against him. Yet God delivered him through uh, through that darkness, through that adversity. Any other comments? That's right. That's exactly right. That is interesting. Yeah. You know, Joab's a prominent character. He's yeah. He's left out of this. That's list. right. Good, good point. All right. We will look at uh, chapter 22 and the first part of chapter 23 next time uh, to cover that. We, I, I, I was a little long-winded tonight. Got us behind, but uh, we'll be able to cover that next time. Thank you for your good attention and good comments. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us 
via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.